the Muslim sources critically, i.e. without presupposing that Islam is true, you'll notice that practically everything in Islam is taken from somewhere else. Muhammad took things from the Jewish Talmud, from heretical Christian groups, from the pagans, from the Persians, from the Sabaeans. And when Muhammad was collecting these teachings and practices, he obviously couldn't tell the difference between what's true and what's not true. Since Muhammad was somewhat reckless in his use of materials, we would expect him to get a bit confused here and there. For instance, the Arabic word for Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the same as the word for Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. So we might expect Muhammad to be confused about this because he didn't know much about Jewish and Christian history. Interestingly, the Quran does confuse Mary, the mother of Jesus, with Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. Let's look at the Quran. Surah 19, 27 through 28, referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus, reads, At length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. They said, O Mary, truly an amazing thing hast thou brought, O sister of Aaron. Thy father was not a man of evil, nor thy mother a woman unchaste. Notice that the Quran refers to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the sister of Aaron. Here, Muhammad obviously thought that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Miriam, the sister of Aaron. This is simply an error in the Quran. Now, Christians during the time of Muhammad recognized this error, and they pointed it out to Muhammad's followers. In Sahih Muslim, number 5326, we read, Mugira bin Shuba reported, When I came to Najran, they, the Christians of Najran, asked me, You read, O sister of Harun, or Aaron, in the Quran, whereas Moses was born much before Jesus. When I came back to Allah's Messenger, I asked him about that, whereupon he said, The people of the old age used to give names to their persons, after the names of apostles and pious persons who had gone before them. So Muhammad's response is that people during the time of Mary would refer to a pious young woman as the sister of X, where X might be a prophet from 1400 years earlier. The problem is that we have no record of such a practice in first century Israel, and we don't even find this practice elsewhere in the Quran. The obvious conclusion, then, is that Muhammad simply made a mistake and that he tried to correct it by making something up. His followers didn't know that he was making it up, but we know that there was no such practice in first century Israel. Two more points are worthy of note in this narration from Sahih Muslim. First, the Christians of Najran knew nothing of the practice of referring to pious young women as sisters of some prophet even though they would have been familiar with traditions about Mary. So they understood this to be an error in the Quran. Second, the Muslim who went to them clearly didn't know that this was a figure of speech. He was totally stumped by the refutation. He had to go back to Muhammad for an answer. So Christians knew nothing of the practice Muhammad referred to, and Muslims who had been reciting the Quran in Muhammad's presence were never told that sister of Aaron was a metaphor. They only heard about this when the error was pointed out to Muhammad. But we can go further. We know from the Muslim sources that Muslims were convinced from the Quran that Mary the mother of Jesus and Miriam the sister of Aaron were the same person. In Ibn Kathir's commentary on Surah 1928, we read this. Muhammad ibn Sirin stated that he was told that Kaab said, the verse that reads, O sister of Harun, does not refer to Aaron, the brother of Moses. Aisha replied to Kab, You have lied! Kab responded, O mother of the believers, if the Prophet, may Allah's prayers be upon him, has said it, and he is more knowledgeable, then this is what he related. Besides, I find the difference in time between them, i.e. Jesus and Moses, to be 600 years. He said that she remained silent. Look at what happens here. Someone tells Aisha that Mary, the mother of Jesus, isn't the sister of Aaron and Moses, and Aisha calls him a liar. Why would she call him a liar unless she was absolutely convinced that the Quran says otherwise? 
And if she was convinced that the Quran proclaims a single Mary, who was both the mother of Jesus and the sister of Aaron and Moses, shouldn't it bother Muslims that Aisha was led into error by the Quran? Shouldn't it bother Muslims that Muhammad never explained this to anyone until it was pointed out as an error? But things get even worse. The father of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam was a man named Amran, or Imran in Arabic. First Chronicles 6, 1 through 3 states, The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The children of Amram were Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Now, think about this for a moment. I'm claiming that Muhammad didn't know the difference between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses. If I'm right, we wouldn't be surprised to find Muhammad identifying Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the daughter of Imran, since Imran was the father of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Not surprisingly, this is exactly what we find in the Quran and the Hadith. In Surah 3, 35-36, we read, Behold, when the wife of Imran said, O oh my Lord, I do dedicate unto thee what is in my womb for thy special service. So accept this of me, for thou hearest and knowest all things. When she was delivered, she said, O oh my Lord, behold, I am delivered of a female child. And Allah knew best what she brought forth, and no wise is the male like the female. I have named her Mary, and I commend her and her offspring to thy protection from the evil one, the rejected. Mary's mother is called the wife of Imran, making Imran the father of Mary. We find the same thing in Surah 66, 12. It says, And Mary, daughter of Imran, who guarded her private parts, and we breathed therein of our spirit, and she verified the words of her Lord and his books, and was of the devout. Again, in Sahih al-Bukhari, number 37, 69, we read, Allah's Messenger said, Many amongst men attained perfection, but amongst women none attained the perfection except Mary, the daughter of Imran, and Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. Notice that Mary's mother is called the wife of Imran, and that Mary is called the daughter of Imran. Behold, when the wife of Imran said, O oh my Lord, I do dedicate unto thee what is in my womb for thy special service. So accept this of me, for thou hearest and knowest all things. When she was delivered, she said, O oh my Lord, behold, I am delivered of a female child. And Allah knew best what she brought forth, and no wise is the male like the female. I have named her Mary, and I commend her and her offspring to thy protection from the evil one, the rejected. Mary's mother is called the wife of Imran, making Imran the father of Mary. We find the same thing in Surah 66, 12. It says, And Mary, daughter of Imran, who guarded her private parts, and we breathed therein of our spirit, and she verified the words of her Lord and his books, and was of the devout. Again, in Sahih al-Bukhari, number 37, 69, we read, Allah's Messenger said, Many amongst men attained perfection, but amongst women none attained the perfection except Mary, the daughter of Imran, and Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh.
Ever since ISIS burned Jordanian pilot Mu'adh al kassaba to death, we've been reminded again and again by politicians, the media, and Muslim organizations that burning people to death is un-Islamic, and that ISIS, therefore, is un-Islamic. You may have noticed that the pundits who keep insisting that Islam forbids killing by fire won't actually quote the passage for us. They won't even give the reference. Why is that? Wouldn't it be nice to have a clear command from Allah or Muhammad handy so that we can throw it in the faces of extremists and discredit them in the eyes of Muslims around the world? Why not quote the passage for us? The reason Islam's Western defenders won't show us where Islam condemns putting people to death by fire is that the passage in question contains Muhammad's standing orders to execute apostates, and it specifically says that apostates were burned to death by none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law and the fourth rightly guided caliph of Islam. It's a passage that promotes the very crimes our leaders have been assuring us have no place in Islam, so no one's going to quote it to you. Except me. Sahih al-Bukhari, 6922. Some Zenaudika, atheists, sort of, who had left Islam, were brought to Ali, and he burnt them. The news of this event reached Ibn Abbas, who said, If I had been in his place, I would not have burnt them, as Allah's apostle forbade it, saying, Do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, fire. I would have killed them according to the statement of Allah's apostle, Whoever changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. What does Ibn Abbas mean when he says that he would have killed them according to the statement of Muhammad, Whoever changed his Islamic religion, kill him. He's referring to beheading, as we read in Malik's Muwatta. The Messenger of Allah said, If someone changes his religion, then strike off his head. So the passage that tells Muslims not to kill apostates by burning them to death commands Muslims to kill apostates by chopping their heads off. Since it would be counterproductive to condemn ISIS by quoting a hadith that promotes the beheadings everyone's been using to condemn ISIS, the media do what they do best and give us a partial truth, the tiny part they want us to hear and not the part that proves what despicable liars they are. But the burning of apostates by Ali raises an obvious question. If Muhammad's followers knew that he said, do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, why was the fourth rightly guided caliph, Muhammad's own son-in-law, the man who certainly wasn't ignorant of Muhammad's commands, burning apostates? One of the reasons is that Muslims are also commanded to follow Muhammad's example, and Muhammad was all too happy to punish people with fire. For instance, Muhammad had his followers torture a man named Kanana by lighting a fire on his chest. The Apostle gave orders to Az-Zubair ibn al-Awam, Torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. Then the Apostle delivered him to Muhammad ibn Maslama, and he struck off his head in revenge for his brother Mahmud. So according to Muhammad, it's perfectly acceptable to torture a man with fire, even though Allah is the one who punishes with fire. What about executing someone? Sahih al-Bukhari, 657. The Prophet said, No salat, prayer, is more heavy for the hypocrites than the Fajr and the Isha prayers, and if they knew the reward for these salat, at their respective times they would certainly present themselves in the mosques, even if they had to crawl. The Prophet added, Certainly I intended, or planned, or was about to order the Mu'adhin to pronounce Iqamah, and order a man to lead the Salat and then take a fire flame to burn all those men along with their houses who had not yet left their houses for the Salat in the mosques. Why did Muhammad want to burn people to death in their houses for missing prayers? Because missing prayers was a way to identify hypocrites. Can you think of any other Muslims who kill people they regard as hypocrites? I sure can. But there's a much more straightforward reason for ISIS to execute a man by fire. The leaders of the Islamic State have modeled their approach after the apostate wars of Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law and closest companion, and the first of the rightly guided caliphs. When Muhammad died, many people left Islam or refused to submit to the central Islamic authority. Abu Bakr sent them a letter and an army. In the letter he said, 
I have sent to you someone at the head of an army. I ordered him not to fight anyone or to kill anyone until he has called him to the cause of God, so that those who respond to him and acknowledge him and renounce unbelief and do good works, my envoy shall accept him and help him to do right. But I have ordered him to fight those who deny him for that reason, so he will not spare any one of them he can gain mastery over, but may burn them with fire, slaughter them by any means, and take women and children captive, nor shall he accept from anyone anything except Islam. Even professing Muslims who rebelled against Abu Bakr could be burned to death. For instance, a man named al fuja who claimed to be a Muslim but was attacking the Islamic State, was brought to Abu Bakr by Turefa. Here's what happened. When the two of them approached Abu Bakr, he ordered Turefa ibn Hajiz to take him out to this clearing and burn him in it with fire. So Turefa took him out to the prayer yard and kindled a fire for him and threw him into it. Now, you may be thinking, who cares what Abu Bakr did? And the answer is, Muslims do. Because when Muhammad was dying, he said to his followers in Sunan ibn Majah 43, I am leaving you upon a path of brightness whose night is like its day. No one will deviate from it after I am gone, but one who is doomed. Whoever among you lives will see great conflict. I urge you to adhere to what you know of my sunnah and the path of the rightly guided caliphs and cling stubbornly to it. So here's the quandary that Muslims face. In Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah commands Muslims to unquestioningly obey Muhammad's decisions. But Muhammad commands Muslims to obey the rightly guided caliphs, and the first of the rightly guided caliphs commands Muslims to burn people to death. By the time we get to the fourth rightly guided caliph, Muslims are still burning people to death. That's when Ibn Abbas suddenly remembers that Muslims aren't supposed to burn people to death, they're supposed to chop off heads. Is it wrong from an Islamic perspective to burn people to death? If it's wrong, then Muslims shouldn't follow the path of the rightly guided caliph, Abu Bakr. But Muhammad said to follow the path of the rightly guided caliphs. So as a Muslim, which command are you supposed to obey? Should you obey Muhammad's command not to punish people with fire? Or Muhammad's command to follow the rightly guided caliphs who burned people to death? Given such contradictory commands, why would we be surprised that some Muslims are burning people to death while others are condemning them for it? Or that Muslims are accusing each other of being hypocrites or apostates and chopping off each other's heads? Or that Muslims are blowing up each other's mosques? Incoherent nonsense is one thing. Violent incoherent nonsense is lethal. Now, to be on the safe side, if you're a Muslim, you shouldn't burn people to death in case Ibn Abbas was right. Better to err on the side of caution. But if you're one of the Muslims calling for ISIS to be punished, think about this. What was the penalty for punishing someone with fire? How was Muhammad punished for torturing a man with fire? What happened to Abu Bakr when he had Muslims burn people to death? What sort of judgment did Ali face for burning apostates? The only punishment for any of them was that Ibn Abbas said, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have chopped off some heads. So the message of Islam is, don't burn people to death. But if you do, If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sirah literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. In the Bible, Jesus says that God loves everyone. In the Quran, not so much. Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle, but if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. According to the Quran, Allah only loves obedient Muslims. I wonder why ISIS doesn't seem to have much love for non-Muslims.
Believe it or not, Allah's complete lack of love for non-Muslims plays a role in how non-Muslims are to be treated. Surah 48, verse 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against unbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe against whom? Against unbelievers. They're merciful to whom? Only to their fellow Muslims. But politicians and the media just can't figure out why ISIS is so severe against non-Muslims. There are lots of ways to be severe against unbelievers. Here's one, Surah 4, verse 24. Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. This may be confusing without the historical context, which you can read in Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. When Muhammad won the Battle of Altas, Allah had already revealed that Muslims were free to rape their female captives. But at Altas, the Muslim army captured certain women along with their husbands, and some of the Muslims started wondering if raping these women counted as adultery, because they were married. That's when Allah revealed Surah 4, verse 24, which says that married women are indeed forbidden as sex partners unless they're your captives. If they're your captives, rape them all you want. Allah couldn't conceivably care less that they're married. Heard about any groups raping their female captives recently? What about people who try to stop the Islamic State from establishing Sharia? Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Notice that there are several penalties, including death, crucifixion, and dismemberment, for the vague crime of making mischief in the land. Since the crime is vague, Muslim groups like ISIS can pack all kinds of offenses into this verse. And yet, the U.S. State Department just put out a video making fun of ISIS for crucifying their enemies. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Since idolaters have to convert or die, you might be wondering why ISIS gives Christians a third option, the option of paying jizya, tribute money. Sur 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, the people of the book are Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the benefit of being a Jew or a Christian, according to Allah, is that you won't necessarily be slaughtered for refusing to convert. You have the option of paying tribute money to Muslims in acknowledgement of your inferiority. Is it just me, or is ISIS following the Quran to the letter? But ISIS doesn't just attack unbelievers. Muslims are also targeted. Why is that? Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them. And their abode is hell, and evil is the destination. The Arabic for strive hard here is a form of the word jihad. So Muslims are commanded to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't doing what Allah tells them to do. The penalty for hypocrisy can vary depending on the severity of the hypocrisy, but when Muslims deviate from core Islamic doctrine, they find themselves in the apostate category, and the penalty for apostasy is death. So when ISIS kills Muslims who aren't adhering to central Muslim doctrines, they're just doing what Allah commands. But what about all the peaceful, westernized Muslims who condemn killing in the name of Allah? 
Sadly, Islam isn't defined by westernized Muslims. It's defined by Allah, who says in Surah 9, verse 111, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Allah defines believers as those who slay and get slain. They keep killing until they get killed. Doesn't sound much like our peaceful Muslim neighbors, but it sounds an awful lot like ISIS. Muslims are only allowed to seek peace when they aren't in a position to violently subjugate their enemies. Allah says in Surah 47, verse 35, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when you should be uppermost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. When the Muslim community is strong enough to slay the idolaters and to subjugate the Jews and Christians and to fight the hypocrites, peace is not an option. If you seek peace when you should be uppermost, you won't have much ground to stand on when ISIS knocks on your door and tells you that you're a hypocrite. This final verse might seem out of place because it's not about rape or slaughter, but you can't really understand how the verses about rape and slaughter fit into Islam as a whole without understanding Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? People in the West have been trying to condemn the Islamic State by quoting peaceful verses of the Quran. How can you guys call yourselves Muslims when the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? But those peaceful verses were revealed before Allah commanded his followers to slay idolaters and to subjugate Jews and Christians and to fight hypocrites. So the most important verse you need to know if you want to understand the Islamic State is Surah 2, verse 106, which lays out the doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses get abrogated or canceled by later verses, which means that versions of Islam that oppose the sort of violence being committed by the Islamic State are now obsolete.
For Christians, I think it is important that you understand what the Quran actually says. So I am creating this series, Reasons to Reject Islam. These are not ordered in any particular order of significance. Reason 1 to Reject Islam Islam allows prostitution. Whoa! Hold your horses! Beep, beep, back up the truck! What you talking about, Willis? The practice is called muta, and it means temporary marriage. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, Nikkei al muta is the fixed term marriage in Shia Islam. The duration of this type of marriage is fixed at its inception and is then automatically dissolved upon completion of its term. The marriage is contractual and is subject to renewal. Financial payments may be made between the couple, usually with the male paying the female, known as mar or dower. Notice the specific Arabic is translated pleasure marriage. Shia and Sunnis agree that muta was legal in the beginning, but Sunnis believe it was abrogated. Ibn Kathir writes, There's no doubt that in the outset of Islam, muta was allowed under the Sharia. You know, you listen and you hear people talking about Sharia law being imposed. That's this Sharia. Temporary marriage was a custom of the pre-Islamic Arabs. It was used as a convenience shield useful in the case where a man had to travel away from home for long periods of time or was not able to commit fully to marriage. Temporary marriage means that a man and woman agree to be married for several hours or days for pay. I don't think I need to explain what playing marriage means. Okay, it means having sexual relations for money. The primary reference from the Quran is Surah 424. It is within a section describing which women Mohammedans can and cannot marry. Surah 420. But if you want to replace one wife with another, and you have given one of them a great amount of gifts, do not take back from it anything. Would you take it in injustice and manifest sin? I think replace means replace. This is talking of getting rid of the earlier wife. And how could you take it while you have gone in unto each other, and they have taken from you a solemn covenant? If you have gone in to each other, you have consummated the covenant. Notice the extent of the Quran's commitment to a solemn covenant. A man should not take back the money he paid to play married. I'll be blunt. Mohammedism considers a trick with a whore an example of what it thinks is a solemn commitment. Can you grasp why Mohammedism is so utterly clueless about God's real covenants? And do not marry those women whom your fathers married. Good thing Muhammad cleared that up for us. Don't take dad's sloppy seconds. But I wonder if this means just while Sheikh Daddio is plowing his tilth. Maybe it's okay once Sheikh D has replaced her for another. Except what has already occurred. Guess this happened a lot before Muhammad came. At least enough for Muhammad <coughs> Allah to mention it. Indeed, it was an immorality and hateful to Allah and was evil as a way. The phrase, to Allah, is a translator comment. Prohibited to you for marriage are your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, your father's sisters or aunt, your mother's sisters or aunt, your brother's daughters, a niece, your sister's daughters, a niece, your milk mothers who nursed you, your sisters through nursing, your wives' mothers, and your stepdaughters under your guardianship, born of your wives unto whom you have gone in. But if you have not gone in unto them, there is no sin upon you. And also prohibited are the wives of your sons, who are from your own loins, and that you take in marriage two sisters simultaneously. Darn it, no twins! Except for what has already occurred, 
indeed Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Allah is so nice grandfathering in such abominable relationships already in place. So given that context of man-made legalities and rationalization by Muhammad, he finally gets to the verse where he talks briefly about paying for marriage. And all married women are forbidden unto you. Save those or accept those captives whom your right hand possesses. It is a decree of Allah for you. Lawful unto you are all beyond those mentioned, so that you seek them with your wealth in honest wedlock, not debauchery. And those whom you seek content, give unto them their portions as a duty. And there is no sin for you in what you do by mutual agreement after the duty. Lo, Allah is ever knower wise. He says it is okay to have sex with the slaves you have acquired. And this is the Sahi International Translation. So for whatever you enjoy from them, give them their due compensation as an obligation. Understand, Muhammad was not talking here about paying for the hummus sandwich the slave made. Muhammad is teaching here to pay for the sex you got from your temporary wife. And paying for sex is prostitution in every civilized region of the world. Muhammad created pleasure marriage to give the men in his army sex. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? But I did not write the Quran. I just take it for what it says. And the Quran approves it. Think about that the next time a Mohammedan tries to say Islam is from the same God. Remember the God of Abraham created marriage to be a covenant for life, till death do you part. Not just wham, bam, thank you ma'am, gotta go back to killing infidel Jews and Christians. Even within Islam, however, there is some disagreement between Shia and Sunni on the subject. That may give you a laugh, given Sunni do not even think Shia are believers. Regarding Muta, however, they argue whether Mo later abrogated it or not. But there is no argument that it is in the Quran. But that raises an interesting question. If Allah wrote the Quran, and the Quran writes about Muta, what right does Muhammad have to change the command of Allah? Hmm. If you call yourself Muslim, do you honor the truth? Do you place any value on logic? I often see Mohammedans attack the Word of God because it records man's sinful actions and talk. But when it comes to the Quran advocating prostitution, they turn a blind eye. This is one reason I reject Islam and will forever. Mohammedism is a religion of sexual pleasure, both now with prostitution, I mean muta, and the eternal orgies promised for the future in the paradise of Mohammed's sick sexual fantasies. May the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have recently been inundated with TV interviews of female converts to Mohammedan Islam who now feel liberated and more respected by their male believers than they were under Christianity. How factual and accurate are their perceptions? Tilth is the cultivation of land tillage, physical condition of soil, especially in relation to its suitability for planting or growing a crop. Most of the verses of the Quran were revealed to Muhammad as a result of incidents utterances, actions, and or deeds by, from, and unto Muhammad or some of his companions. They are almost invariably in hindsight and after an event. This verse of the Quran also was the result of such an incident as shown below. Sahih al-Bukhari 6.51 narrated by Jabir. Jews used to say, if one has sexual intercourse with his wife from the back, then she will deliver a squint-eyed child. So this verse was revealed. Your wives are a tilth unto you, so go to your tilth when or how you will. 2.223.
Sunan of Abu Dawud Hadith 2159 narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas. Ibn Umar misunderstood the Quranic verse, so come to your tilts however you will. May Allah forgive him. The fact is that this clan of the Ansar, who were idolaters, lived in the company of the Jews who were the people of the book. They, the Ansar, accepted their superiority over themselves in respect of knowledge, and they followed most of their actions. The people of the book, i.e. the Jews, used to have intercourse with their women on one side alone, i.e. lying on their backs. This was the most concealing position for the vagina of the women. This clan of the Ansar adopted this practice from them. But this tribe of the Quraysh used to uncover their women completely and seek pleasure with them from in front and behind and laying them on their backs. When the Muhajirun, the immigrants, came to Medina, a man married a woman of the Ansar. He began to do the same kind of action with her, but she disliked it and said to him, we were approached on one side, i.e. lying on the back. This matter of theirs spread widely, and it reached the Apostle of Allah. So Allah the Exalted sent down the Quranic verse, your wives are a tilth to you, so come to your tilth however you will, i.e. from in front, from behind, or lying on the back. But this verse meant the place of the delivery of the child, i.e. the vagina. Al-Baqarah 2.223 Your wives are a tilth unto you, so approach your tilth when or how you will. Until today, the ulama have not agreed on whether or not this verse gave the right to the husband to have anal intercourse with his wife or woman or not. The traditions, as usual, contradict each other by the opposing views giving isnads proving their points all the way to Muhammad. Ladies and gentlemen, humans can enjoy sex by numerous positions, not only two. If having sex from behind is more revealing and hence presumably more enjoyable, then the Ansari women had no reason to complain. The fact that the Ansari women objected to the intercourse must have been because it was not a vaginal act but an anal one. Al-Bukhari narrated after Ibn Umar that Al-Baqarah 2.223 was revealed on the issue of having anal intercourse with women. Al-Tabaradi narrated in Al-Aswat with a reliable chain of traditions that your women are a tillage for you was only revealed to license anal intercourse. Ibn Abbas narrates that Umar ibn al-Khattab went before the Messenger of Allah and said, Master, I am destroyed. The Messenger of Allah asked, What thing has destroyed you? Umar replied, Last night I had anal sex. The Messenger of Allah did not give a reply to Umar. Then Allah sent down this revelation. Your wives are a tilth unto you, so approach your tilth when or how you will. The words Kabul wa Dabar mean the anus is accepted. These can be found in Asbab al Nuzul by a Suyuti on Surah Al Baqarah 2.223. It beggars belief that Umar was expecting damnation just because he had sex with his wife, penetrating her vagina from behind. What is certain is that with this verse, Allah supported the men. They had the right to use the positions that they wanted. Women had no right to protest. They had only to submit to their husband's whims. In any case, this verse excluded women from the debate and by so doing transformed the question which was thus reduced to the following. Do men have the right to have sex with their wives in any manner, time and place? Without a shadow of a doubt, all the hadith simply disregard and degrade the rights of women by giving men the right to completely ignore the wishes of their women regarding sexual positions, times or places. Neither in the Quranic verse above nor in any of the ahadith is the woman's point of view addressed or considered, since according to both they are inferior to the man and should be treated as a possession just like a domesticated animal. The following hadith is added further confirmation of Muhammad's and his Quran's attitude to women. Sahih Muslim Hadith 1032 narrated by Abu Dahr. The Messenger of Allah said, When any one of you stands for prayer, his prayer would be cut off by the passing of an ass, a woman, or a black dog. I said, O oh Abu Dahr, what feature is there in a black dog which distinguishes it from the red dog and the yellow dog? He said, O oh son of my brother, I asked the Messenger of Allah as you are asking me, and he said, The black dog is a devil. Sahih al-Bukhari Hadith 1.301 narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Once Allah's Apostle, 
passed by the women and said, O women, give alms, as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire were you, women. They asked, Why is this so, O Allah's Apostle? He replied, You curse frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. The women asked, O oh Allah's Apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? He said, Is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. He said, This is the deficiency in her intelligence. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses? The women replied in the affirmative. He said, This is the deficiency in her religion. If the women were more astute and less afraid of Muhammad, they would have replied to Muhammad, The reason that the witness of two women is equal to one man and that we are not allowed to pray or fast during our menses are because you told us that Allah ordained this. These were not so before Islam. Sahih al-Bukhari 1.493 narrated by Aisha. The Prophet said, The things which annul prayer were mentioned before me and those were a dog, a donkey and a woman. I said, You have compared us women to donkeys and dogs. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 7.30 narrated by Abdullah bin Umar. Allah's Apostle said, Bad omen is in the women, the house and the horse. Sahih al-Bukhari 7.33 narrated by Osama bin Zayd. The Prophet said, After me, I have not left any affliction more harmful to men than women. Al-Nisa 4.34 Men are the protectors and maintainers of women. The righteous women are devout. As to those women on whose part you fear the disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them, refuse to share their beds, beat them. Ladies and gentlemen, the most illuminating point in this sordid state of affairs is the complete one-sidedness of all the discussions and arguments and the utter lack of logic, morality or justice, since all of them are conducted by the Mohammedan males, thus excluding completely and totally ignoring or taking into account the rights of the Mohammedan women, the ones who are being victimized. Muhammad and his Quran show neither respect no recognition of Muhammadan women as dignified, intelligent, and equal human beings to the Muhammadan men. Those European women who are converting to Muhammadan Islam could not have possibly been made aware of the degrading and humiliating verses in the Quran and Hadiths regarding the treatment of females by Muhammad's cult belief system.